Hi, this is Betsy Brantner Smith with the National Police Association, and this is the NPA Report. I have with me a, a guest today who uh, I've known for a long time, and she's a fellow cop and a fellow trainer and a fellow athlete, and uh, and she is a dear, dear friend and my sister, Jean Kanakogi. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Betsy. I'm so happy to be here. Or should I call you doctor? You can call me anything. I know you so long, <laughs> as long as you don't call me late to dinner. <laughs> right. So we have so much to talk about. I want to I want to get right to it. So you were raised in kind of an unconventional way. Um, talk a little bit about that and how that led you to this this uh, incredible career in law enforcement. Uh, well, I was born and raised in Brooklyn, but nothing, well, typical Brooklyn, it, it's just a, a mix of everything. My mom was a street fighter Jewish lady from Coney Island that subsequently became the mother of women's judo. And my father is from Japan of samurai lineage. So you can only imagine how it was in that household. So I, I became, I was a member of the US judo team. I trained in their dojo. Uh, I, play, I was an athlete, as you had mentioned. And uh, right before the chances of, of making the 88 team for the Olympics, I blew out my knee. But I'm so connected to the 88 Olympics because my mother got women's judo into the 1988 Olympics. So I took another path and I ended up going into law enforcement. So here you are, this amazing athlete and a fighter, and you blow out your knee, and, uh, and then you decide, well, um, since I can't be this high-level fighter, I think I'll go into federal law enforcement. What did your parents think about that? Uh, well, my mom actually was super, super happy when I told her that I applied to U.S. Customs and I was selected. And she said, wow, this is great. So she, I also applied to the NYPD and the same day I was selected and I had to make a decision. So uh, all of my friends from Brooklyn, they were all NYPD, but she said, you know, do something different, try something different, go federal. So I went federal and I entered, I became a US customs inspector, oh gosh, like 23 years ago. Uh, and it, it was a great time there, but as I was, developing my skills in law enforcement, I felt I was starting to shift and see things a little bit differently. Uh, I went from being an athlete, an international athlete, making friends and just, you know, hugging and, and, and loving how I see things to seeing people who were desperate, who did things out of sheer greed and actually seeing people who were soulless. So you started seeing what uh, all police officers around the country see is the dirty underbelly of American society, right? That's true. And, and I felt that it, I couldn't even disconnect it because when you go to a movie theater, when you're out walking, when you're interacting with people who were not fellow inspectors, you start looking a little bit different at everyone and you start to see what, what I call development of cop size. And, and I'm sure everybody knows what that is. And not only do you start having that stress of seeing the underbelly of what's out there, but you also feel the organizational stress. Of course, you know, working for a large agency, you have to worry about not only walking to your car and not only doing your job because you're trying to protect America from the influx of, at that time I was working narcotics, but also some of the people that you work with were just very upset at their job and they tried to take it out on everybody. You know, the, the people who you just couldn't trust some colleagues. And that just grew on you and grew on you and it really just affects your psyche. So fast forward uh, quite a bit of time or a few years, where were you on 9-11-01? Unfortunately, I was working at 26 Federal Plaza, which is only a few blocks from September 11th. And uh, that was my duty station. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I was on the rescue recovery, um, digging on that pile and assigned to the Joint Terrorism Task Force. Uh, it went from rescue recovery just straight to recovery. Uh, so that was, um, it was just a horrible, I, I can't even say a horrible day, but it was just a horrible everything. Because life as we knew it um, 
life as we thought we knew it completely changed in, in a heartbeat. So you saw the continued toll that uh, seeing the, un the unthinkable had on your colleagues. And yes. you decided um, to do something about that, didn't you? I did. It, it took some time because, you know, at, with 9-11 is when we started hearing more and more about uh, PTSI, post-traumatic stress injury, because it's not a disorder, it's an injury. Uh, and given the early 2000s, people were still in the mentality of suck it up. Don't talk about it. Just brush it under the carpet. You know, this is your job or you, you've signed up for this. And, and we hear that a lot. But you didn't sign up for this and you're a human being. It doesn't matter what uniform, what badge you carry, you're still a human being. And it's so overwhelming on every part of the sense. And September 11th is not just the one incident. It's every time you go to the doctor, every time you go for your lung x-ray, and every time you hear about another colleague that has passed since, not just the colleagues that you've lost in there. So the totality of all of that builds up and builds up and builds up. And now with the Federal Law Enforcement Officers Association, I'm the Director of Mental Health and Peer Support. And this is an inaugural position where our president, Larry Cosme, mm -hmm. followed the support of the last administration who was completely about mental health and wellness. And he told me, let's create this position and I want you to do something. So I'm always that person. When somebody says, call someone, I'm the someone. So do something, I'm the something. So I know that for a fact. <laughs> so what, it, what is that something? So I'm thinking, okay, the something. We have to develop a peer support program to augment what's already out there. Uh, right now, agencies have EAPs. They have the larger agencies have peer support. But again, like I mentioned earlier in, in our conversation, sometimes people can't trust others within their organization or they just don't feel comfortable. So I wanna make it where you can go across the board. So we're starting to develop that. But what's really, really important is we're work, working with uh, Acadia Health and the treatment placement specialist. Now, the two guys that we're working with, uh, Bill Mazur and Joe Collins, they're both retired police chiefs. And what they do is they vet the counselors to the ones that actually understand the law enforcement culture. Because a lot of times law enforcement will go and seek counseling and seek somebody to, to talk to about their anxiety, about their stress, about their depression. And the counselor literally wants to crawl out the window. Right. I mean, as we're fond of saying, you know, uh, most police officers in the first four years of their career will see more stress and strife and trauma and horror than most people see in a lifetime and, and frankly ever should see. But if you don't have a counselor who's able to deal with that, that actually what happens, an officer trying to seek treatment actually gets re-traumatized, don't they? They do. They get re-traumatized because they're made to feel that they're doing something wrong by talking about what they're feeling. So what do they do? They clam up and, and they take it out in maybe a bottle. And uh, unfortunately, the statistics, the CDC statistics uh, have, have revealed that law enforcement are 59% more likely to commit suicide. 59% more likely yes. to commit suicide. That's an extraordinary statistic that I want that, that needs to give everyone pause. And it's true, right? That we die at least twice as often by our own hand as we do by felonious assaults. That's true. And that's why part of the do something is to bridge this gap and smash the stigma. When I say bridge the gap, bridge the gap between law enforcement being all the way over here and counseling being all the way over here. We've got to get it together. And I think what we're doing, working, uh, you know, it's baby steps, but working with Arcadia Health and getting culturally competent counselors available to help these people. And of course, you can't count what hasn't happened but you can know in your heart that you're, that you're helping people. And you know, part of this inaugural position is to work on legislation to cover confidentiality. 
Uh, I've been working on uh, bipartisan bills. And matter of fact, there's one that has passed the Senate and we're just waiting for it to go before Congress to offer confidentiality for peer support on a federal level because states have it. I know that uh, I'm working with the Deputy Attorney General's uh, legal division in New Jersey, they have it. They have peer support and resilience officers that are not held to task but on a federal level, it, it's a careful dance and working across the board, uh, both sides of the house. And I'm sure this current administration is going to be just as supportive as the past administration was in uh, understanding that mental health and especially mental health for law enforcement is paramount. Now you've experienced your own trauma and stress both on the job and off. Um, you lost your mom to a, a, a serious illness a few years ago, didn't you? I did. I lost my mom to multiple myeloma. And uh, I'll tell you, she's, she is such a role model. What a, she was just some, she was a fighter. Uh, one, of, one of the mantras that she used to tell me all the time when I was training under her and when I was competing in judo was to get up and fight. And she lived by example. So being the overachiever you are, you decide to write a book. I happen to have it autographed by the author here. And, uh, and it's called Get Up and Fight, right? Talk about it, this book. It's, I, I'm in the middle of it right now, and it, it's extraordinary. Well, Get Up and Fight is, is something that we came up with because it was what, we, what I affectionately call a rustyism. And a rustyism is uh, what would Rusty say? And half the time Rusty was either barking orders or telling me to get up and fight. And I'll tell you a little bit about her. She, uh, she was born, and like I mentioned earlier for in Brooklyn, she was a girl street gang leader. She did time for boosting cars. Uh, really in the 1950s in Coney Island, I mean, she hustled. And then, uh, you know, just like everybody else, she was an ordinary person from a broken household. There was alcoholism. Uh, there, there were painkiller drugs uh, because her mom got uh, mangled in one of the machines in Coney Island. So she had to fend for herself and she had all this energy. She was also big and strong and she was always fighting. But one day she found somebody, she had to go to an Al-Anon meeting because unfortunately she had a, a bad first marriage. And so she went to Al-Anon to try to support and try to encourage him uh, from, from his ways. And she met a friend who said, oh, you know, I'm working out. And she's like, oh, what do you do for, to work out? And he says, I do judo. She didn't know what judo was. And, and back in the 50s, all she knew was judo. That's Japanese. Wait a minute, are we friends with them? Well, fast forward. She was so thrilled when he said, let me show you. And he picked her up on his hip. Like she was nothing, like she was a lightweight. And she's like, I have to do this. So she followed him to the YMCA and became part of the class after standing there and not, not backing off. They didn't want her in the class. She was the only woman. So they made her change in a broom closet. And then finally she started being in, becoming embraced with all the guys in the class. And she paid her dues. I mean, fall down seven, get up eight. Well, at a tournament in 1959, one of her teammates was injured. So she was five foot nine, short hair, not very well endowed. And they said, ah, Rusty, you go in. It's, it's all men, but who cares? Well, she was thrilled to be able to compete. And her team was, you know, her, her coach said, well, just don't get noticed. Just pull a draw. Well, Rusty couldn't do that. She's like, I trained so hard for this. Her team is like, yeah, go Rusty, go Rusty. Well, she won. And then she's like, oh boy. I won. Well, uh, later on, somebody ratted her out and said that she was a woman because apparently there was a sore loser. And uh, they told her, you have to forfeit your medal. Otherwise your team will win, lose the first place win that they got. She thought about it and she gave back her medal, but that was the turning point. She said, no woman will ever suffer such an indignity ever again. From there, she devoted her life to equality for women in sport with Title IX and Billie Jean King, and also for equality for women in judo. And she didn't understand why women didn't have the opportunity to be told you're an Olympian. So she fought and sued and did everything she possibly could and finally became the coach for the 1988 Olympics that she got women's judo into the Olympics. So the amazing thing about this story, Get Up and Fight, 
it's not a judo story. It's a story about the little guy having a voice and overcoming obstacles, overcoming challenges. And also it's an inspiring story to know that you can get up and fight. That it, Rusty wasn't born you know, a rich lady or with a big education. She was an ordinary person that changed the world for so many. And this book will want to make you get up and fight. Absolutely, there is no victimization in this book and and that's what i love about it so much so and, and i love you know your uh your perspective on it um as a daughter you know how did so how did you come to be involved in judo because as you know as a cop you know obviously you had to learn how to fight but then you ended up teaching others how to fight but how did you get involved was that just a natural part of your upbringing I was literally, she was pregnant with me. So I was literally born on the mat. Her doctor was one of her students. And as she was counting contractions in the hospital, she was helping him with his upcoming black belt test. <laughs> so, and then she's like, oh boy, it's time. So he's like, okay, we got to go grab a baby. And so I was literally born on the mat. And, and it's funny because throughout life, Rusty taught me, and another Rustyism is in life, either you are the hammer or the nail. She looked at me and you, she said to me, and she pointed right at me, be the hammer. And, and being the hammer is not necessarily being the bully, being stronger than anyone else. Being a hammer is being that person that can embrace everyone else, being and lead everyone else. And the mo she based her success on the more lives that she touched in a positive way that excelled. She said she, she would raise the bar so high and only because she knew that you can dig deep inside and reach that bar. And then she would ask you, if you don't get it the first time, why not? Now, when you got into law enforcement, now you had already, you know, you were chosen to be an Olympic athlete um, until you got hurt. So what was that like when you're at the police academy and they're about to teach you defensive <laughs> tactics or whatever? Talk about that. You know, back, back in the first academy, they had this, this insane technique. Like I didn't, I, one thing I couldn't wrap my head around was that I had a gun now because I was always looking to go hands-on. So, you know, if somebody pulled out a knife, I'm like, boom, throw them. And that was it. So I had, the first thing I had to learn was now I have a gun. So uh, then the takedowns were so different because the judo takedowns were so different or the versus the tactical takedowns. And then I had to start remembering, I do have a gun, so I have to practice weapon retention and no weapon and non-weapon side. So at first it was a little bit of a different, uh, a very trying time, but I adapted very quickly because judo, uh, it teaches you resilience and, and to adapt so quickly not only did I adapt to the skills, but I started enhancing the skills. And that's when I became a control tactics and defensive tactics instructor, because I also saw a gigantic disconnect. People, the six foot four guy was teaching the five foot four woman the same technique. And no, it's not going to work. So women have different center of gravities, different strength levels. And you know what? Why not just build on your strength and what you're good at? You have a lower center of gravity as a female, use that lower center of gravity for a takedown or to immobilize somebody and get somebody to, to get into compliance. Then also I noticed that there were a lot of just furtive commands, do this, do that. Well, you know what? You can, talk, you can also learn how to talk somebody into handcuffs if given the situation and then have them tell you, thank you. And that's one of the skills. And this is one of the things, you know, you teach, I teach. That's one of the women are very good at talking people into and out of various situations. And I know that's one of your strengths where, you know, yeah, can you flip somebody around and can you fight, you know, and all that stuff. But if you can do it verbally, right. And, you know, why not? And that's one of the things that, that we were talking off camera about. Um, that you're so good at. And that's one of the things everybody wants police officers to be able to do now, right? Is to get people to comply without having to use force. And that's one of the things you teach, isn't it? 
It is. One of, one of the key is just understanding human behavior. Granted, yes, I have a PhD in psychology, so maybe I have a little bit of knowledge and research, but I research human behavior so much that sometimes it's so easy just to say please and thank you in a non-commanding tone. Now, granted, you have to have officer presence. We all have to go home at night and safety first. Sometimes you do have to go hands-on. Sometimes a little extra force up front will save a lot of force at the end. Sometimes that's necessary, but also uh, so many times more than anything, you can reason with somebody who can show you that they are reasonable. And again, you're not gonna have a 30 minute conversation with somebody on why they did something, but sometimes if you just listen to somebody what they wanna be heard, okay, sir, ma'am, I heard you, but this is protocol for my safety and yours. Please put your hands behind your back, knuckles together, thumbs up, bend over, don't move. Simple. And you say it in that tone, as opposed to in an accusatory tone and, and speaking down to them. And you give them that, that command. And it's almost like they're playing Simon Says because they want to do that. I love it. Where, where can people find the book and where can they find more, uh, more about it? They could find me, they could find the book at www.rustykanakogi.com. So you can contact me, you can get the book there. Uh, we're also on Amazon, uh, Get Up and Fight on the Amazon Kindle. And uh, soon we're going to have a global release with a whole new look, a whole new cover, some more words, some more pictures, and I'm working on the audio book. So that should be out hopefully by summer. I am so thrilled that I got a chance to spend a few minutes with you. I can't thank you enough. And if you would like more information about the National Police Association, visit us at nationalpolice.org. This year, over 50,000 law enforcement officers have been assaulted while on duty. A vast number of these attacks were filmed and uploaded to social media in the pursuit of likes and attention. What they want to do is film you instead of like, what can I do to help this officer? Together, we can change this disturbing trend. If that individual would have hit the right spot, you know, it, it could have been it for me. You know, last time I would have saw my wife, my kids. I'm Mike Solon. Law enforcement officers need your support. If you see an officer under attack, then follow these simple steps in order to help. 1. Call 911 and give the officer's exact location. 2. Ask the officer if you can assist. If the officer accepts, then do whatever you can do to safely help. 3. If the officer declines, then start filming and be a good witness. It's time to stop filming and start helping.